Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, as my tradition is, most of you know whenever I speak, I always do some silly thing. And I, I guess it won't be today because I don't see my... Oh, here they are. I always have to have a note, a, a couple of jokes to start us out. Because this is, is going to be a relatively serious message. So let's be a little bit lighthearted with it. Um, deep within the forest, a little turtle kept climbing up a tree, working and working. After hours of effort, he reached the top, jumped into the air, and waving his front legs and crashed to the ground. Poor little fellow. After recovering, he slowly climbed the tree again, jumped and fell to the ground. The little turtle tried this again and again and again and while there was a couple of birds sitting on a branch watching him. And after they watched him for a while, finally the female bird turned to her mate and said, Dear, I think it's time we tell him he was adopted. Poor little guy. He didn't know any better. A man and a woman were married for many years. Uh-oh, that's it's getting pretty close to home there. Whenever there was a confrontation, yelling could be heard deep into the night. The old man would shout, when I die, I will dig my way up out of the grave and come back and haunt you for the rest of my life. So, I mean, he was really a mean old feller. The neighbors feared him. The old man liked the fact that he was feared. Then one evening he died when he was 88. After the burial, her neighbors, concerned for her safety, asked, Aren't you afraid that indeed he may be able to dig his way out of the grave and haunt you for the rest of your life? She said, let him dig. I had him buried upside down, and I know he won't ask for directions. <laughs> All right, one more. <clears throat> Two of the aspiring psychiatrists were attending their first class on emotional extremes. Just to establish some parameters, said the professor to the student from Arkansas. We have any Arkansas years here today? Uh, what is the opposite of joy? Sadness, said the student. And the opposite of depression, he asked a young lady from Oklahoma. Elation, she said. And you, sir, he said to the young man from Texas. What is the opposite of woe? The Texan replied, sir. I believe that would be giddy up. <laughs> giddy up instead of whoa. All right, now let's get serious. This isn't serious yet either, though. So. How many of you can tell me the Ten Commandments, all ten of them? We had this test here a few years or so ago, probably. Anybody know them? What's the fifth commandment? Anybody know what the fifth commandment is? Very good. Who said that? Oh, good. Number seven. Uh, a little boy came home from church one day, and, and his mama said, did you learn anything from church? And he said, yeah. Uh, we studied the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not admit adultery. <laughs> he got that wrong. <laughs> Uh, there are Ten Commandments, and I'm not going into that today, but there is a very simple way to remember them. I've got some flashcards here, and one of these, I'll review that with you someday, but not today. That's just to remind you that the Ten Commandments are very plain and very too direct and to the point. There's only one of them that tells us that is a positive. Most of them say, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But there's one that says, Thou shalt honor thy parents, or with this commandment. It's the only commandment with a promise that says, And you shall have long days of life. But the Ten Commandments basically tell us what not to do. And once we're born again, the Holy Spirit pretty well tells us that. You know, when we talk about uh, winning people to the Lord by telling them, oh, Brother Jimmy, good to see you back there, man. I haven't seen you for a long time. Uh, we, we figure that uh, we need to tell people what their sins are and uh, convict them. You know, well, that's the job of the Holy Spirit, and most of the time they already know what's wrong. 
we need to tell them what's right, and that's what that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to introduce them to him. They're already convicted, probably, of their sin. They know they're a sinner. Most people do. So the, uh, the Holy Spirit convicts us of what not to do. But it's still good to read the Word of God to know his will. You know, the, the Word, the law, is to teach us and to show us the standard and the, the ideal and, and what is perfect and what God wants us to do. For the life of a Christian is much more than thou shalt not. Let's look in uh, John 6, verse 28 to 29. Uh, this is occurred right after the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, Jesus was ministering to the people, telling, teaching them uh, the Beatitudes. And he was the, the Sermon on the Mount is where this is coming from. And then they said to him, and the they that we're talking about here are the, the Jews or the Pharisees and the people in the crowd. It wasn't their, their, uh, his disciples, but it was just the, the crowd. And they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? In verse 29, Jesus said, answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So the work of God is not something that we do per se. It is the, 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 the indwelling and the presence of the Spirit of God within us. So what are the works of God? We're commanded. Jesus said, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven in Matthew 5 and 16. Your light as it's talking about here, indicates your influence for good as you interact with a secular society. So our good works are allowing Jesus to shine through our lives. That's what our good works are. He is within. He has cleansed us. He has washed us with his blood, and we are to let him shine through our life. One of the, if you're interested in specific works, James 1, to 27 gives us an answer there. Uh, an illustration of some of the good works that God, the works of God that we can be a part of. And this is to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Um, didn't have that one up there, so... Uh, but true religion and undefiled is this, he says, to, to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Again, that unspotted, that means you are pure, you are washed with the blood of Jesus. The visiting of the fatherless and the widows can be done by anyone. I mean, there are a lot of uh, humanitarian people that, that, that take care of widows and orphans. But unless it's done in the spirit of the Lord, it really becomes the works of the flesh. And we want it to be the works of God. James 2.20 says, faith without works is dead. And I think really it doesn't specifically say this, but the reverse is that is also true. Also true. Works without faith is dead. Those are dead works of the flesh. We may accomplish things. There are a lot of humanitarian things that can be done to help people. But unless God is in it, it is a work of the flesh. So that's what the Pharisees were asking Jesus in John 6. How do we work the works of God? They wanted to be recognized as the leaders. These were the Pharisees. They said, how do we work the works of God? This is kind of like the guy that, uh, uh, that was following Paul around, and he saw him doing all these miracles. He says, give me, I'll give you money so that I can do these things too. And Paul said, your money perish with you. You know, you're not, this is not something you can buy. The, 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 the power, the anointing of the Spirit of God is not something you can purchase. It is given to us as a free gift by the, by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not something that you can purchase. And, it's, and the works of God, in order to do the works of God, we've got to have God within us. We can't do the works of the flesh and, and consider it being the works of God. They wanted to, the acclaim, the, the Pharisees and the, the leaders of the Jews at that time wanted the acclaim of men. 
without the power of the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 17. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Accidentally, now, not intentionally. And they shall drink any deadly thing, and it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These are the works of God. And these are the works that we should be doing. We can... I mean, there are many people around that are sick and could use the laying on of hands. The scripture tells us and teaches us uh, how to use the laying on of hands to minister to people and bring life and healing. But it is only by the Spirit. uh, When we were in Africa, we met a a man who, uh, some of you may have read his book. It's called Like a Mighty Wind. His name is Mel Tari. It was a book that was written 30 years, 40 years ago probably. But he was a, a tiny little man from Indonesia. And he got saved and filled with the Spirit of God. And he witnessed many of these things that is written here. That they picked up serpents. They would eat deadly things. That pe- the people tried to kill them. They literally walked on the water to get out to reach people. He saw the dead being raised from back to life. It was a, a, a mighty move of God among these people in those many years ago. Uh, So this is how, by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, this is how we do the works of God. You try any of these things in the flesh and you'll fail. It's not going to work. They are ineffective. And the only way they are effective is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just remember the seven sons of Sceva, S-C-E-V-A, however you pronounce that, and it talks about it in the book of Acts. They tried to cast out evil spirits in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And they all seven got beat up and sent out naked. Seven of them. One guy beat him up because of the the influence of evil spirits on this man. And because they were acting in the flesh using the quote, the name of Jesus. So when we use the name of Jesus, you know, we, we... pray, we say in Jesus' name, and we do this in Jesus' name and that, we need to be sure we're doing it in Jesus' name, not just in the flesh, using a, a quote, a formula to see something happen. We need to be hearing from God, a quote, a formula to see something happen. We need to be hearing from God and let the Spirit of God tell us how to do it and what to do. These guys all got beat up in the name of Jesus because they used the name of Jesus but did not have his authority. The works of God are empowered by the Holy Spirit with the believer. Verse 16 in this same, where was this? 1620 of what? Mark. Um, And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So we read about what the apostles did and how they went out ministering and seeing miracles and signs and wonders happen. Well, why was that happening? Because the Lord was working with them. You know, we read about visiting orphans and widows. I looked it up on the Internet, and there are approximately 153 million orphans orphans in this world, so many of them because of AIDS in Africa, but uh, all around this world there are children that are without parents. So there's plenty of work to be done, and I'm not saying don't help them, you know, but if we're going to do it works of God, we need to have his spirit leading us and guiding us. Um, We were, I was told in Bible school that uh, The need does not justify the call. In other words, there are lots and lots of needs in this world around us. And just because there's a need doesn't necessarily mean that I'm called to meet that need. You need to listen. You need to hear. You need to pray. You need to listen to the Spirit of God. Because there's way more than any one of us can do. So we need to hear what God's plan is for us, individually. In, each individual has a specific call of God on their life. Many of us go through life without ever really realizing that. 
and we just kind of stumble along and, and do whatever we try to do and and sometimes we do good and sometimes we don't and probably most of us are like that uh, I know I've made big plenty of mistakes and blunders in my life but uh, we need to listen and hear the voice of God and do what he says to do pray and then obey that's the answer um, it's a good thing when you desire to do the works of God, but you must be willing to let the Lord work with you. It must be by faith and not by our own flesh. I remember we were on our way to Africa for, we were going to work for in the mission field. For, we had a three-year contract to work in South Africa. And we had sold our house, we'd sold our car, we gave away our car. It wasn't worth selling. <laughs> but we gave it to some friends and they, they could use it. And we were in Miami and uh, the people I was working for said they were going to send us tickets and they would be waiting for us at the airport in Miami. So I got there with my three children and we were, Joyce and I were there in the airport with no money, no credit card, no nothing really. We had some money, but we didn't. You know, we, we didn't have credit cards, and, and we went to the pick ticket counter, and they said, well, yes, we have you reserved on this flight, but there are no tickets. I said, tickets? Why aren't there any tickets? They told us there'd be tickets. So I went to call people in South Africa that I'd been communicating with. I had a phone number, and so I called a collect, and they said, we don't accept collect calls especially not overseas collect calls. So I said, well, okay. <laughs> and I went to the change. They had a little bank station there in the airport, and I got two rolls of quarters. And I ne nearly used both rolls of quarters calling South Africa. I I got the answer, and I started plugging in these quarters as fast as I could so they wouldn't hang up before I got them all plugged in. And finally, I got a hold of the guy and talked to him, and who was going to be my boss for the next three years. And, and he said, well, yes, we, we sent those tickets, but we have you on the flight for tomorrow, not today. So anyway, I, I, not acting in my own flesh, I did <laughs> I let the Lord take care of it after I acted in my own flesh. And so, but anyway, he did. He took care of it. And we just switched it over and got on. They said, since the tickets are already paid for, you can be on today's flight. That's fine. And off you go. So the Lord takes care of us even when we mess up. But sometimes our works of the Lord. Here I was in Africa. I was a missionary trying to serve the people. And for some reason, my uh, electricity got cut off in our house. I mean, God had blessed us with this house. I mean, it, it, there's lots of miraculous stories and how the Lord took care of everything that we needed. And this morning, I woke up. It was on a Friday. No, Friday, no, it was a Friday evening. I got home from work, and the electricity was off. Well, that wasn't unusual. We had power outages fairly commonly. And so I didn't think anything about it until it got dark and all my neighbor's lights were on. Uh, my lights aren't on, what's going on? So finally, by the, we had a little gas cook stove we managed to cook with, and, and, uh, but that's about all we had. We had a little propane tank that we could cook supper. My wife's a good camper, she figured out how to make supper. But Monday morning, I went to the office the electricity office and uh, let them know that they had cut off my electricity and what in the world was going on. Well, it turns out I hadn't filled out my check correctly. I'd written the check, I'd sent it in, and for some reason they, they write their checks differently in South Africa than we do. You have to write out the numbers, even the percentage, even the coins has to be written out as well. And so they didn't cash my check. And so they shut off my electricity because they didn't have any money. Well, this missionary began to act in the flesh. And I'll tell you what, I, I didn't know that was in me. <laughs> I was supposed to be a missionary. I was supposed to be a Christian. 
And I started yelling, and I didn't take the Lord's name in vain, but at least I let them know that I was quite upset. And by the time I got through, I slammed the door and ran out, and instead of walking or taking the elevator to the fifth floor of the other building where my office was, I ran up the stairs. And my boss met me, <laughs> the same one I talked to on the phone several months before. I said, are you all right? <laughs> I was completely out of breath. I couldn't talk. So anyway, the works of the flesh are apparent, and the works of the Spirit are something altogether different. Psalms 127.1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh in vain. So all of our good intentions are no avail unless the Lord is with us. In order to work the works of God, we need to be like God. Now, Satan wanted to be like God, didn't he? But that's not what God says. In fact, God wants us to be like him. In fact, that's why he gave us Jesus, so that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus was the firstborn, and we, uh, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And we are to be like Jesus. And he gave us the ability to be like him. Because he gave us his Holy Spirit. He wants us to become exactly like him. In Romans 8, 29, he says, We are predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. brothers, Brethren, depending upon which version you're using. So God's plan for all of us is to be like Jesus. Or does that mean that we have to wander through the streets of Jerusalem and lay hands on people and see them healed and raised from the dead? Well, maybe, but probably not. Most of us aren't going to have that type of ministry. But we are allowed, we are to allow the Holy Spirit to rule and reign excuse me, in, in us that we demonstrate the love of God in our attitude and our works. Jesus is the man that we are to be like, and he has given us the ability to do that by his Holy Spirit indwelling within us. It's that there's, there's this constant battle going on in our lives, day in, day out, every moment of our lives. The flesh wants to rise up and do things my way, but God is there, and he wants to do things his way. So it's up to us to put the flesh down and let him rule and reign. I want to read this one out of the Word because it's a little bit lengthy. Um, Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11 tells us a little bit about who Jesus is. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And coming into the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that, at the, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Praise God. That's our goal. That's our example. And he is more than an example because he has given us his Holy Spirit. We could never do that. We could never be like Jesus without his power. But he has given us the Spirit of God to indwell us, to enable us to be a little more like him. We're never going to make it. I think if we ever reach perfection, he's just going to take us home anyway. So, uh, and I don't think that's ever going to happen until we get there. I wanted to read a... If I can find this one. Where did I put it? We have a, a devotional that we got from Oswald Chambers. Uh, many of you have 
read those that's called my utmost for his highest. The one we read just a few days ago really touched me in that, well, I'm just going to read it and see if it touches you too. The bravery of God in trusting in us. But he has been unwise to choose me because there's nothing in me. I'm not of any value. That's why he chose you. As long as you think there is something in you, he cannot choose you because you have ends of your own to serve. But if you have let him bring you to the end of your self-sufficiency, then he can choose you to go with him to Jerusalem. And that will mean the fulfillment of purposes which he does not discuss with you. He's got a plan for you. All we got to do is say, yes, sir, no, sir, okay, sir, I'll do what you say. We don't know his plans. We don't know his methods. We don't know how he's going to do what he's going to do. But if we're willing and if we trust him, we will be a part of it. And that's amazing. We are apt to say that because a man has natural abilities, therefore he will make a good Christian. It's not a question of our equipment, but of our poverty. Not what we bring with us, but, what of, but of what God puts into us. Not a question of natural virtues, of strength or character or knowledge or an experience. And all of that is no avail in this matter. The only thing that avails is that we are taken up into the big compelling of God and made his comrades. That's amazing in itself. The comradeship of God is made up out of men who know their poverty. He can do nothing with a man who thinks he is of use to God. If you think you're something, then you ain't going to be much good. If you recognize and realize how little you have compared to God, then he can use you. As Christians, we are not out for our own cause at all. We are out for the cause of God, which can never be our cause. We do not know what God is after, but we have to maintain our relationship with him, whatever happens. That's where the source of our power is, is with relationship with him. We must never allow anything to injure our relationship with God. If it does get injured, we must take time and get it right. The main thing about Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. Let me read that again. The main thing about Christianity is not the work that we do. Remember, we're talking about what is the work of God? The work of God is the relationship we have with him. It's not the work we do, but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. This is all God asks us to look after. And it, that is, our relationship with God, is the one thing that is being continually assailed. In other words, that's what the the enemy is always trying to deal with. He's always trying to affect that relationship, that intimacy with the Father. Jesus emptied himself of everything. He was creator, master designer of unknown numbers of species and plants and animals, creator of all things visible and invisible, and he became a helpless child on our behalf. He emptied himself of everything he had. Can you imagine the trust that God had in Mary and Joseph? I mean, they were living in a pretty violent society, and yet God chose to put Baby Jesus as a totally helpless infant. Look at Penelope back there. She's not so helpless anymore, but she still can't take care of herself. She can't feed herself. She can't provide everything for herself. Up to mom and dad. And Jesus was in that same situation. He had to rely entirely upon two people, two human beings, to train him and and raise him up. He emptied himself of everything he had. We also need to empty ourselves of all of our self-righteousness and allow the Spirit of God to fill us and use us for his glory. 
back up several years ago, 45, thereabouts, 50, almost 47 or so, I was trying to get into veterinary school. And uh, I had made application, and I got a letter back, said, sorry, you didn't make it. I'll put you on the reserve list. If anybody backs out, then you can get in. They only had 80 spots. And there was five of us on the reserve list, and I didn't get in. That was my goal. That was my plan. I had planned to be a vet all my, ever since I was a little kid. Even when my counselor told me, there was a high school counselor, said, there's no way you're going to be able to do that. You're not smart enough. You're not this enough or something. So I uh, decided I was going to do it. <laughs> anyway, and, uh, but I was rejected. They said, no, you're, you're not, you're not going to make it. But. So I basically, I humbled myself and I said, okay, Lord, uh, this is what I want to do, but if you've got something better, that's fine. So I made an application to the College of Education. I thought, I'm going to be a teacher. If I can't be a vet, I'll be a teacher. Well, come the next year, a whole year of taking classes and going to school and taking a variety of different classes instead of just pre-vet classes, I got a letter from the College of Education. It said, you've been accepted. Well, what am I going to do now? I still wanted to be a vet. And then I got a letter from the College of Veterinary Medicine that I'd been accepted. So, praise God, you know, I, I basically said, okay, Lord, I want your will, not mine. Send me where you want me to go. I'll go there. And praise God, it happened to agree with what I wanted, and that's good. But it would have been good either way, because I wanted God's will, not mine. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in each of you so that whatsoever we do in word or deed, we do it all to the name, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3.23, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. So what are the works of God? Every one of us has a different one or two or three. Teaching Sunday school, cleaning the church, mowing the grass, baking cookies. Baking cookies. Did you bring me any today? No. Um, visiting the sick, praying for healing, casting out devils. Could be any or all of these things. Anything the Lord leads you to do, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. You know, I don't see in the Bible where there was any veterinarians. Uh, so I can't go to the Word of God and say, this is what the Word told me to do. God uses what you love. He knows your personality. He knows your character. He knows what you like to do and what you don't like to do. And he's not going to, well, I'm not going to say that because God can do what he wants. But generally, he doesn't make you do something you just totally don't want to do at all. Even as a little child, I wanted to see Africa. I always wanted to go. God opened the doors for me. And I'm, I'm blessed because of it. It was an experience I'll never forget. And hopefully we did some good while we were there. So whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Be the best employee you can be. Be the best boss you can be. Best homemaker, the best teacher, the best whatever God has put before you to do. Whatever you have chosen to do. You know, we think, well, I chose this. Well, you know, God probably had a little bit of point, a little bit into that. Be the best truck driver you can be. And, and you know, we can represent Christ wherever we go, whatever we do. All of these things in this life, you know, we have to provide a living for ourselves. The Bible says if man who doesn't work doesn't need to eat. So I like to eat, so I wanted to work. And uh, so we all need to provide for our families. That's, that's just, I mean, the Word tells us we need to do that. So by what method we earn our living is not that important. I mean, there are some 
professions and things that the Lord frowns on, I'm sure. Uh, we won't go into that. But uh, do it all as unto the Lord. So how do we work the works of God? <laughs> I, I've got four here, but I'm not going to go start my four-point sermon now. I'm finishing my four-point sermon. First of all, we've got to believe on Him. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and He will direct your paths. Fellowship with Him. We have to have a relationship with the Lord, or we're going to do things our own way. I mean, we do anyway. Most of us, we do a lot of things our own way. But if we have fellowship with Him and ask Him and specifically say, Lord, what shall I do? How do I do this? Where do you want me to go? Uh, most of us are, um, I, I, I say most, maybe I'm just talking about me. So many times I, I just want to do it my way. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. <laughs> but ask him. Fellowship with him. First of all, believe on him. Receive the infilling of the Spirit of God. Fellowship with him. Make that close communion. Number three, then ask him. Lord, what do I do in this situation, this situation, whatever? What shall I do? And then obey. Ask him and then obey. I was, I remembered that uh, the pastor of the largest church in the world, pastor used to be called Paul Youngie Cho, now he's called David Youngie Cho. He always said when he was just starting out, he says, how did you manage to do this? And he said, well, I pray and I obey. That's simple. That's it. You just ask the Lord. Say, pray, Lord, what do I do? This is what you do. Okay, I'll do it. You know, that's a pretty simple formula. Just two things to do. Pray and obey. And he will direct your paths. So let's do the works of God. Remember, when we do it our own way, it's like wood, hay, and stubble. You know, the scripture tells us that there's, there's precious gold and stones and the things are tested by fire and those things that are wood, hay, and stubble, those things that are done of our own flesh, they're going to burn up, not going to mount to anything. You can't take any of this stuff with us to heaven. What's the only thing you can take with you to heaven? Other people. Other people. So be a blessing to other people. Teach them. Witness to them, love them, help them when they need help, and just listen to the voice of God and let him show you what we need to do.